Section 9 of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Undying Thing. 1. Up and down the oak paneled dining hall of Mansteth, the master of the house walked restlessly. At formal intervals down the long, severe table were placed four silver candlesticks, but the light from these did not serve to illuminate the whole of the surroundings. It just touched the portrait of a fair-haired boy with a sad and wistful expression that hung at one end of the room. It sparkled on the lid of a silver tankard. As Sir Edric passed to and fro, it lit up his face and figure. It was a bold and resolute face, with a firm chin and passionate, dominant eyes. A bad past was written in the lines of it. And yet, every now and then there came over it a strange look of very anxious gentleness that gave it some resemblance to the portrait of the fair-haired boy. Sir Edric paused a moment before the portrait and surveyed it carefully. His strong brown hands locked behind him, his gigantic shoulders thrust a little forward. "'Ah, what I was,' he murmured to himself, "'what I was.' Once more he commenced pacing up and down. The candles mirrored in the polished wood of the table had burnt low. For hours Sir Edric had been waiting, listening intently for some sound from the room above or from the broad staircase outside. There had been sounds, the wailing of a woman, a quick abrupt voice, the moving of rapid feet, but for the last hour he had heard nothing. Quite suddenly he stopped and dropped on his knees against the table. God, I have never thought of thee, thou knowest that. Thou knowest that by my devilish behavior and cruelty I did veritably murder Alice, my first wife albeit the physicians did maintain that she died of a decline, a wasting sickness. Thou knowest that all here in man's death do hate me, and that rightly. They say, too, that I am mad, but that they say not rightly, seeing that I know how wicked I am. I always knew it. But I never cared until I loved. Oh, God, I never cared." His fierce eyes opened for a minute, glared round the room, and closed again tightly. He went on. God, for myself I ask nothing. I make no bargaining with thee. Whatsoever punishment thou givest me to bear, I will bear it. Whatsoever thou givest me to do, I will do it. Whether thou killest Eve, or whether thou keepest her in life, and never have I loved but her, I will, from this night, be good. In due penitence will I receive the holy sacrament of thy body and blood, and my son, the one child that I had by Alice, I will fetch back again from Chalency, where I kept him, in order that I might not look upon him. And I will be to him a father indeed, and very truth, and in all things, so far as in me lieth, I will make restitution and atonement. Whether thou hearest me, or whether thou hearest me not, these things shall be. And for my prayer it is but this. Of thy loving kindness, most merciful God, be thou with Eve, and make her happy. And after these great pains and perils of childbirth, send her thy peace. Of thy loving kindness, thy merciful loving kindness O oh god perhaps the prayer that is offered when the time for praying is over is more terribly pathetic than any other yet one might hesitate to say that this prayer was unanswered sir edric rose to his feet once more he paced the room there was a strange simplicity about him the simplicity that scorns an incongruity he felt that his lips and throat were parched and dry he lifted the heavy silver tankard from the table and raised the lid. There was still a good draught of mulled wine in it, with the burnt toast cut heart-shape floating on the top. 
to the health of eve and her child he said aloud and drained it to the last drop click click as he put the tankard down he heard distinctly two doors opened and shut quickly one after the other and then slowly down the stairs came a hesitating step sir edric could bear the suspense no longer he opened the dining-room door and the dim light strayed out into the dark hall beyond Denison, he said in a low sharp whisper is that you yes yes i am coming sir edric a moment afterwards dr Denison entered the room he was very pale perspiration streamed from his forehead his cravat was disarranged he was an old man thin with the air of proud humility sir edric watched him narrowly then she is dead he said with a quiet that dr Denison had not expected twenty physicians a hundred physicians could not have saved her sir edric she was he gave some details of medical interest Denison said sir edric still speaking with common restraint why do you seem thus indisposed and panic-stricken you are a physician have you never looked upon the face of death before the soul of my wife is with god yes murmured Denison, a good woman a perfect saintly woman and sir edric went on raising his eyes to the ceiling as though he could see through it her body lies in great dignity and beauty upon the bed and there is no horror in it why are you afraid i do not fear death sir edric but your hands they are not steady you are evidently overcome does the child live yes it lives another boy a brother for young edric the child that alice bore me there there is something wrong i do not know what to do i want you to come upstairs and sir edric i must tell you you will need your self-command Denison, the hand of god is heavy upon me but from this time forth until the day of my death i am submissive to it and god send that that day may come quickly i will follow you and i will endure he took one of the high silver candlesticks from the table and stepped towards the door he strode quickly up the staircase dr Denison following a little way behind him as sir edric waited at the top of the staircase he heard suddenly from the room before him a low cry he put down the candlestick on the floor and leaned back against the wall listening the cry came again a vibrating monotone ending in a growl Denison, Denison, his voice choked he could not go on yes said the doctor it is in there i had the two women out of the room and got it here no one but myself has seen it but you must see it too he raised the candle and the two men entered the room one of the spare bedrooms on the bed there was something moving under the cover of a blanket dr Denison paused for a moment and then flung the blanket partially back they did not remain in the room for more than a few seconds the moment they got outside dr Denison began to speak sir edric i would fain suggest somewhat to you there is no evil as sophocles hath it in his antigone for which man hath not found a remedy except it be death and here sir edric interrupted him in a husky voice downstairs Denison. this is too near it was indeed passing strange when once the novelty of this occurrence had worn off dr Denison seemed no longer frightened he was calm academic interested in an unusual phenomenon but sir edric who was said in the village to fear nothing in earth or in heaven or hell was obviously much moved when they had got back to the dining room sir edric motioned the doctor to a seat now then he said i will hear you something must be done and tonight 
"'Exceptional cases,' said Dr. Dennison, "'demand exceptional remedies. "'Well, it lies there upstairs, and is at our mercy. "'We can let it live, or, placing one hand over the mouth and nostrils, "'we can stop,' said Sir Edric. "'This thing has so crushed and humiliated me that I can scarcely think. "'But I recall that while I waited for you, "'I fell upon my knees and prayed that God would save Eve. "'And as I confessed unto him more than I will ever confess unto man, "'it seemed to me that it were ignoble to offer a price for his favour. "'And I said that whatsoever punishment I had to bear, I would bear it. And whatsoever he called upon me to do, I would do it. And I made no conditions. Well? Now my punishment is of two kinds. Firstly, my wife Eve is dead. And this I bear more easily, because I know that now she is numbered with the company of God's saints. And with them her pure spirit finds happier communion than with me. I was not worthy of her, and yet she would call my roughness by gentle, pretty names. She gloried, Denison, in the mere strength of my body and in the greatness of my stature, and I am thankful that she never saw this, this shame that has come upon the house. For she was a proud woman, with all her gentleness, even as I was proud and bad until it pleased God this night to break me, even to the dust. And for my second punishment, that too I must bear. This thing that lies upstairs I will take and rear. It is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Only if it be possible I will hide my shame so that no man but you shall know of it. This is not possible. You cannot keep a living being in this house unless it be known. Will not these women say, Where is the child? Sir Edric stood upright, his powerful hands linked before him, his face working in agony, but he was still resolute. Then, if it must be known, it shall be known. The fault is mine. If I had but done sooner what Eve asked, this would not have happened. I will bear it. Sir Edric, do not be angry with me, for if I did not say this, then I should be but an ill counsellor. And firstly, do not use the word shame. The ways of nature are past all explaining. If a woman be frail and easily impressed, and other circumstances concur, then in some few rare cases a thing of this sort does happen. If there be shame, it is not upon you, but upon nature, to whom one would not lightly impute shame. Yet it is true that common and uninformed people might think that this shame was yours, and herein lies the great trouble. The shame would rest also on her memory. Then, said Sir Edric, in a low, unfaltering voice, this night, for the sake of Eve, I will break my word, and lose my own soul eternally. About an hour afterwards, Sir Edric and Dr. Dennison left the house together, the doctor carried a stable lantern in his hand. Sir Edric bore in his arms something wrapped in a blanket. They went through the long garden, out into the orchard that skirts the north side of the park, and then across a field to a small dark plantation known as Hal's Planting. In the very heart of Hal's Planting there are some curious caves. Access to the innermost chamber of them is exceedingly difficult and dangerous and only possible to a climber of exceptional skill and courage. As they returned from these caves, Sir Edric no longer carried his burden. The dawn was breaking, and the birds began to sing. Could not they be quiet just for this morning? said Sir Edric wearily. There were but few people who were asked to attend the funeral of Lady Van Crest, and of the baby, which it was said, had only survived her by a few hours. There were but three people who knew that only one body, the body of Lady Van Crest, 
was really interred in that occasion. These three were Sir Edric Van Carest, Dr. Dennison, and a nurse whom it had been found expedient to take into their confidence. During the next six years Sir Edric lived almost in solitude, a life of great sanctity, devoting much of his time to the education of the younger Edric, the child that he had by his first wife. In the course of this time some strange stories began to be told and believed in the neighborhood with reference to Hal's planting, and the place was generally avoided. When Sir Edric lay on his deathbed, the windows of the chamber were open, and suddenly through them came a low cry. The doctor in attendance hardly regarded it, supposing that it came from one of the owls in the trees outside. But Sir Edric, at the sound of it, rose right up in bed before anyone could stay him, and flinging up his arms, cried, "'Wolves! Wolves! Wolves!' Then he fell forward on his face, dead. And four generations passed away. Two. Towards the latter end of the nineteenth century, John Marsh, who was the oldest man in the village of Mansteth, could be prevailed upon to state what he recollected. His two sons supported him in his old age. He never felt the pinch of poverty, and he always had money in his pocket. But it was a settled principle with him that he would not pay for the pint of beer which he drank occasionally in the parlor of the stag. Sometimes Farmer Wythwaite paid for the beer. Sometimes it was Mr. Spicer from the post office. Sometimes the landlord of the stag himself would finance the old man's evening dissipation. In return, John Marsh was prevailed upon to state what he recollected. This he would do with great hardiness and strict impartiality, recalling the intemperance of a former Winthwaite and the dishonesty of some ancestral spicer while he drank the beer of their direct descendants. He would tell you with two tough old fingers crooked round the handle of the pewter that you had provided how your grandfather was a poor thing, fit for nought but to break stains by Tarod's side. He was so disrespectful that it was believed that he spoke truth. He was particularly disrespectful when he spoke of that most devilish family, the Van Carests. And he never tired of recounting these stories that from generation to generation had grown up about them. It would be objected sometimes that the present Sir Edric, the last surviving member of the race, was a pleasant-spoken young man, with none of the family wildness and hot temper. It was for no sin of his that Hal's planting was haunted, a thing which every one in Mansteth and many beyond it most devoutly believed. John Marsh would hear no apology for him, nor for any of his ancestors. He recounted the prophecy that an old madwoman had made of the family before her strange death, and hoped fervently that he might live to see it fulfilled. The third baronet, as has already been told, had lived the latter part of his life after his second wife's death in peace and quietness. Of him John Marsh remembered nothing, of course, and could only recall the few fragments of information that had been handed down to him. He had been told that this Sir Edric, who had traveled a good deal, at one time kept wolves, intending to train them to serve as dogs. These wolves were not kept under proper restraint, and became a kind of terror to the neighborhood. Lady Van Carest, his second wife, had asked him frequently to destroy these beasts, but Sir Edric, although it was said that he loved his second wife even more than he hated the first, a vast obstinate when any of his whims were crossed, and put her off with promises. Then one day Lady Van Carest herself was attacked by the wolves. She was not bitten, but she was badly frightened. That filled Sir Edric with remorse, and when it was too late he went out into the yard where the wolves were kept and shot them all. A few months afterwards Lady Van Carest died in childbirth. It was a queer thing, John Marsh noted, 
that it was just at this time that Hal's planting began to get such a bad name. The fourth baronet was, John Marsh considered, the worse of the race. It was to him that the old madwoman had made her prophecy, an incident that Marsh himself had witnessed in his childhood and still vividly remembered. The baronet, in his old age, had been cast up by his vices on the shores of melancholy. Heavy-eyed, gray-haired, bent, he seemed to pass through life as in a dream. Every day he would go out on horseback, always at a walking pace, as though he were following the funeral of his past self. One night he was riding up the village street, as this old woman came down it. Her name was Anne Ruthers. She had a kind of reputation in the village, and although all said that she was mad, many of her utterances were remembered, and she was treated with respect. It was growing dark, and the village street was almost empty. But just at the lower end was the usual group of men by the door of the stag, dimly illuminated by the light that came through the quaint windows of the old inn. They glanced at Sir Edric as he rode slowly past them, taking no notice of their respectful salutes. At the upper end of the street there were two persons. One was Anne Ruthers, a tall, gaunt old woman, her head wrapped in a shawl. The other was John Marsh. He was then a boy of eight, and he was feeling somewhat frightened. He had been on an expedition to a distant and fetid pond, and in the black mud and clay about its borders he had discovered live newts. He had three of them in his pocket, and this was to some extent a joy to him. But his joy was dampened by his knowledge that he was coming home much too late, and would probably be chastised in consequence. He was unable to walk fast or to run, because Ann Ruthers was immediately in front of him, and he dared not pass her, especially at night. She walked on until she met Sir Edric, and then, standing still, she called him by name. He pulled in his horse and raised his heavy eyes to look at her. Then, in loud, clear tones, she spoke to him, and John Marsh heard and remembered every word that she said. It was her prophecy of the end of the Van Crests. Sir Edric never answered a word. When she had finished, he rode on, while she remained standing there, her eyes fixed on the stars above her. John Marsh dared not pass the mad woman. He turned round and walked back, keeping close to Sir Edric's horse. Quite suddenly, without a word of warning, as if in a moment of ungovernable irritation, Sir Edric wheeled his horse round and struck the boy across the face with his switch. On the following morning, John Marsh, or rather his parents, received a handsome solatium in coin of the realm, but sixty-five years afterwards he had not forgiven that blow, and still spoke of the Van Crests as a most devilish family, still hoped and prayed that he might see the prophecy fulfilled. He would relate, too, the death of Anne Ruthers, which occurred either later on the night of her prophecy or early on the following day. She would often roam about the country all night, and on this particular night she left the main road to wander over the Van Crest lands, where trespassers, especially at night, were not welcomed. But no one saw her, and it seemed that she made her way to a part where no one was likely to see her, for none of the keepers would have entered Hal's planting by night her body was found there at noon on the following day, lying under the tall bracken, dead, but without any mark of violence upon it. It was considered that she had died in a fit. This naturally added to the ill repute of Hal's planting. The woman's death caused considerable sensation in the village. Sir Edric sent a message to the married sister with whom she had lived, saying that he wished to pay all the funeral expenses. This offer, as John Marsh recalled with satisfaction, was refused. Of the last two baronets he had but little to tell. The fifth baronet was credited with the family temper, but he conducted himself in a perfectly conventional way, 
and did not seem in the least to belong to romance. He was a good man of business and devoted himself to making up as far as he could for the very extravagant expenditure of his predecessors. His son, the present Sir Edric, was a fine young fellow and popular in the village. Even John Marsh could find nothing to say against him. Other people in the village were interested in him. It was said that he had chosen a wife in London, a Miss Gurdon, and would shortly be back to see that Mansteth Hall was put in proper order for her before his marriage at the close of the season. Modernity kills ghostly romance. It was difficult to associate this modern and handsome Sir Edric, bright and spirited, a good sportsman and a good fellow, with the doom that had been foretold for the Van Crest family. He himself knew the tradition and laughed at it. He wore clothes made by a London tailor, looked healthy, smiled cheerfully, and in vain attempt to shame his own headkeeper, had himself spent a night alone in Hal's planting. This last was used by Mr. Spicer in argument. Who would ask John Marsh what he had made of it? John Marsh replied contemptuously that it was nout. It was not so that the Van Crest family was to end, but when the thing, whatever it was, that lived in Hal's planting left it and came up to the house, to Mansteth Hall itself, then one would see the end of the Van Crests. So Anne Ruthers had prophesied. Sometimes Mr. Spicer would ask the pertinent question, how did John Marsh know that there really was anything in Hal's planting? This he asked less because he disbelieved than because he wished to draw forth an account of John's personal experiences. These were given in great detail, but they did not amount to very much. One night John Marsh had been taken by business. Sir Edric's keepers would have called the business by hard names into the neighborhood of Hal's planting. He had there been suddenly startled by a cry, and had run away as though he were running for his life. That was all he could tell about the cry. It was the kind of cry to make a man lose his head and run. And then it always happened that John Marsh was urged by his companions to enter Hell's planting himself and discover what was there. John pursed his thin lips together and hinted that that also might be done one of these days. Whereupon Mr. Spicer looked across his pipe to Farmer Winthwaite and smiled significantly. Shortly before Sir Edric's return from London, the attention of Mansteth was once more directed to Hell's planting, but not by any supernatural occurrence. Quite suddenly, on a calm day, two trees there fell with a crash. There were caves in the center of the plantation and it seemed as if the roof of some big chamber in these caves had given way. They talked it over one night in the parlor of the stag. There was water in these caves. Farmer Winthwaite knew it, and he expected a further subsidence. If the whole thing collapsed, what then? Aye, said John Marsh. He rose from his chair and pointed in the direction of the hall with his thumb. What then? He walked across to the fire, looked at it meditatively for a moment, and then spat in it. A truly wonderful old man, said Farmer Winthwaite, as he watched him. End of Section 9 Section 10 of Stories in the Dark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Undying Thing. Three. In the smoking room at Mansteth Hall sat Sir Edric with his friend and intended brother-in-law, Dr. Andrew Gerardin. Both men were on the verge of middle age. There was hardly a year's difference between them, yet Guerdon looked much the older man. That was perhaps because he wore a short black beard, while Sir Edric was clean-shaven. 
Guerdon was thought to be an enviable man. His father had made a fortune in the firm of Guerdon, Guerdon, and Bird. The old style was still retained at the bank, although there was no longer a Guerdon in the firm. Andrew Guerdon had a handsome allowance from his father, and had also inherited money through his mother. He had taken the degree of doctor of medicine. He did not practice, but he was still interested in science, especially in out-of-the-way science. He was unmarried, gifted with perpetually good health, interested in life, popular. His friendship with Sir Edric dated from their college days. It had for some years been almost certain that Sir Edric would marry his friend's sister, Ray Guerdon, although the actual betrothal had only been announced that season. On a bureau in one corner of the room were spread a couple of plans and various slips of paper. Sir Edric was wrinkling his brows over them, dropping cigar ash over them, and finally getting angry over them. He pushed back his chair irritably and turned towards Guerdon. "'Look here, old man,' he said. "'I desire to curse the original architect of this house, to curse him in his down-sitting and his uprising.' Seeing that the original architect has gone to where beyond these voices there is peace, he won't be offended. Neither shall I. But why worry yourself? You've been rooted in that blessed bureau all day, and now after dinner, when every self-respecting man chucks business, you return to it again, even as a sow returns to her wallowing in the mire. Now, my good Andrew, do be reasonable. How on earth can I bring Ray to such a place as this? and it's built with such ingrained malice and vexatiousness that one can't live in it as it is and can't alter it without having the whole shanty tumbled down about one's ears. Look at this plan now. That thing is what they are pleased to call a morning room. If the window had been there, there would have been an interrupted view of open country. So what does this forsaken fool of an architect do? He sticks it there! where you see it on the plan, looking straight on to a blank wall with a stable yard on the other side of it. But that's a trifle. Look here again. I won't look any more. This place is all right. It was good enough for your father and mother, and several generations before them, until you arose to improve the world. It was good enough for you until you started to get married. It's a picturesque place, and if you begin to alter it, you'll spoil it. Guerdon looked round the room critically. "'Upon my word,' he said, "'I don't know of any house where I like the smoking room as well as I like this. It's not too big, and yet it's fairly lofty. It's got those comfortable-looking oak-paneled walls. That's the right kind of fireplace, too, and these corner cupboards are handy.' "'Of course, this won't remain the smoking room. It has the morning sun, and Ray likes that, so I shall—' make it into her boudoir. It is a nice room, as you say. That's it, Ted, my boy, said Guerdon bitterly. Take a room which is designed by nature and art to be a smoking room and turn it into a boudoir. Turn it into the very deuce of a boudoir with the morning sun laid on forever and ever. Waste the 12th of August by getting married on it. Spend the winter in foreign parts and write letters that you can breakfast out of doors, just as if you'd created the mildness of the climate yourself. Come back in the spring and spend the London season in the country in order to avoid seeing anybody who wants to see you. That's the way to do it. That's the way to get yourself generally loved and admired. That's chiefly imagination, said Sir Edric. I'm blessed if I can see why I should not make this house fit for Ray to live in. It's a queer thing. Ray was a good girl. And you weren't a bad sort yourself. You prepare to go into partnership, and you both straight away turn into despicable lunatics. I'll have a word or two with Ray, but I'm serious about this house. Don't go tinkering it. It's got a character of its own, and you'd better leave it. Turn half Tottenham Court Road, and the culture thereof, heaven help it, into your townhouse, if you like, but leave this alone. Haven't got a townhouse yet. Anyway, I'm not going to be unsuitable. I'm not going to feel myself at the mercy of a big firm. I shall supervise the whole thing myself. 
I shall drive over to Challensea tomorrow afternoon and see if I can't find some intelligent and fairly conscientious workmen. That's all right. You supervise them, and I'll supervise you. You'll be much too new if I don't look after you. You've got an old legend, I believe, that the family's coming to a bad end. You must be consistent with it. As you are bad, be beautiful. By the way, what do you yourself think of the legend? It's nothing, said Sir Edric, speaking, however, rather seriously. They say that Hal's planting is haunted by something that will not die. Certainly an old woman, who for some godless reason of her own made her way there by night, was found there dead on the following morning. But her death could be and was accounted for by natural causes. Certainly, too, I haven't a man in my employ who'll go there by night now. Why not? How should I know? I fancy that a few of the villagers sit boozing at the stag in the evening and like to scare themselves by swapping lies about Hell's planting. I've done my best to stop it. I once, as you know, took a rug, a revolver, and a flask of whiskey and spent the night there myself, but even that didn't convince them. Yes, you told me. By the way, did you hear or see anything? Sir Edric hesitated before he answered. Finally, he said, Look here, old man, I wouldn't tell this to anyone but yourself. I did think that I heard something. About the middle of the night I was awakened by a cry. I can only say that I was the kind of cry that frightened me. I sat up, and at that moment I heard some great heavy thing go swishing through the bracken behind me at a great rate. Then all was still. I looked about, but I could find nothing. At last, I argued, as I would argue now, that a man who is just awake is only half awake, and that his powers of observation by hearing or any other sense are not to be trusted. I even persuaded myself to go to sleep again, and there was no more disturbance. However, there is a real danger there now. In the heart of the plantation there are some eaves and a subterranean spring. Lately there has been some slight subsidence there, and the same sort of thing will happen again in all probability. I wired today to an expert to come and look at the place. He has replied that he will come on Monday. The legend says that when the thing that lives in Hal's planting comes up to the hall, the van crests will be ended. If I cut down the trees and then break up the place with a charge of dynamite, I shouldn't wonder if I spoiled that legend. Gurdon smiled. I'm inclined to agree with you all through. It's absurd to trust the immediate impressions of a man just awakened. What you heard was probably a stray cow. No cow, said Sir Edric impartially. There's a low wall around the place. Not much of a wall, but too much for a cow. Well, something else. Some equally obvious explanation. In dealing with such questions, never forget that you're in the 19th century. By the way, your man's coming on Monday. That reminds me, today's Friday, and as an indisputable consequence, tomorrow's Saturday, therefore. If you want to find your intelligent workman, it will be of no use to go in the afternoon. True, said Sir Edric. I'll go in the morning. He walked to a tray on a side table and poured a little whiskey into a tumbler. They don't seem to have brought any seltzer water, he remarked in a grumbling voice. He rang the bell impatiently. Now why don't you use those corner cupboards for that kind of thing? If you kept a supply there, it would be handy in case of accidents. They're full up already. He opened one of them and showed that it was filled with old account books and yellow documents tied up in bundles. The servant entered. Oh, I say, there isn't any seltzer. Bring it, please. He turned again to Gordon. You might do me a favor when I'm away tomorrow. If there's nothing else that you want to do, I wish you'd look through all these papers for me. They're all old. Possibly some of them ought to go to my solicitor, and I know that a lot of them ought to be destroyed. Some few may be of family interest. It's not the kind of thing that I could ask a stranger or a servant to do for me, and I've so much on hand just now before my marriage. But of course, my dear fellow, I'll do it with pleasure. 
I'm ashamed to give you all this bother. However, you said that you were coming here to help me, and I take you at your word. By the way, I think you'd better not say anything to Ray about the Hell's Planting story. I may be some of the things that you take me for, but really I am not a common ass. Of course I shouldn't tell her. I'll tell her myself, and I'd sooner do it when I've got the whole thing cleared up. Well, I'm really obliged to you. I needn't remind you that I hope to receive as much again. I believe in compensation. Nature always gives it and always requires it. One finds it everywhere, in philology and onwards. I could mention omissions. There are few, and make a belief in a hereafter to supply them, logical. Lunatics, for instance? Their delusions are often their compensation. They argue correctly from false premises. A lunatic believing himself to be a millionaire has as much delight as money can give. How about deformities or monstrosities? The principle is there, although I don't pretend that the compensation is always adequate. A man who is deprived of one sense generally has another developed with unusual acuteness. As for monstrosities, of it all a human type, one sees none. The things exhibited in fairs are, almost without exception, frauds. They occur rarely, and one does not know enough about them. A really good textbook on the subject would be interesting. Still, such stories, as I have heard, would bear out my theory. Stories of their superhuman strength and cunning, and of the extraordinary prolongation of life that has been noted, or is said to have been noted in them. But it is hardly fair to test my principle by exceptional cases. Besides, anyone can prove anything except that anything was worth proving. That's a cheerful thing to say. I wouldn't like to swear that I could prove how the Hell's Planting legend started, but I fancy, do you know, that I could make a very good shot at it. Well, my great-grandfather kept wolves. I can't say why. Do you remember the portrait of him? Not the one when he was a boy. The other. It hangs on the staircase. There's now a group of wolves in one corner of the picture. I was looking carefully at the picture one day and thought that I detected some overpainting in that corner. Indeed, it was done so roughly that a child would have noticed it if the picture had been hung in a better light. I had the overpainting removed by a good man, and underneath there was that group of wolves depicted. Well, one of these wolves must have escaped, got into Hal's planting, and scared an old woman or two. That would start a story, and human mendacity would do the rest. Yes, said Guerdon meditatively. That doesn't sound improbable. But why did your great-grandfather have the wolves painted out? 4. Saturday morning was fine, but very hot and sultry. After breakfast, when Sir Edric had driven off to Challensea, Andrew Guerdon settled himself in a comfortable chair in the smoking-room. The contents of the corner cupboard were piled up on a table by his side. He lit his pipe and began to go through the papers and put them in order. He had been at work about a quarter of an hour when the butler entered rather abruptly, looking pale and disturbed. "'In Sir Edric's absence, sir, it was thought that I had better come to you for advice. There's been an awful thing happened.' "'Well?' "'They've found a corpse in Hell's planting about half an hour ago. It's the body of an old man.' john marsh who used to live in the village he seems to have died in some kind of fit they were bringing it here but i had it taken down to the village where his cottage is then i sent to the police and to a doctor there was a moment or two's silence before guerdon answered this is a terrible thing i don't know of anything else that you could do stop if the police want to see the spot where the body was found, I think that Sir Edric would like them to have every facility. Quite so, sir. And no one else must be allowed there. No, sir. Thank you. 
The butler withdrew. Guerin arose from his chair and began to pace up and down the room. What an impressive thing a coincidence is, he thought to himself. Last night the whole of the Hal's planting story seemed to me not worth consideration. But the second death there, it can be only coincidence. What else could it be? The question would not leave him. What else could it be? Had that dead man seen something there and died in sheer terror of it? Had Sir Edric really heard something when he spent the night there alone? He returned to his work, but he found that he got on with it but slowly. Every now and then his mind wandered back to the subject of Hal's planting. His doubts annoyed him. It was unscientific and unmodern of him to feel any perplexity, because a natural and rational explanation was possible. He was annoyed with himself for being perplexed. After luncheon, he strolled round the grounds and smoked a cigar. He noticed that a thick bank of dark slate-colored clouds was gathering in the west. The air was very still. In a remote corner of the garden, a big heap of weeds was burning. The smoke went up perfectly straight. On the top of the heap, light flames danced. They were like the ghosts of flames in the strange light. A few big drops of rain fell. The small shower did not last for five seconds. Gordon glanced at his watch. Sir Edric would be back in an hour, and he wanted to finish his work with the papers before Sir Edric's return, so he went back into the house once more. He picked up the first document that came to hand. As he did so, another smaller, and written on parchment, which had been folded with it, dropped out. He began to read the parchment. It was written in faded ink, and the parchment itself was yellow, and in many places stained. It was the confession of the third baronet. He could tell that by the date upon it. It told the story of that night when he and Dr. Dennison went together, carrying a burden through the long garden, out into the orchard that skirts the north side of the park, and then across a field to a small dark plantation. It told how he made a vow to God and did not keep it. These were the last words of the confession. Already upon me has the punishment fallen, and the devil's wolves do seem to hunt me in my sleep nightly. But I know that there is worse to come. The thing that I took to hell's planting is dead, yet will it come back again to the hall, and then will the van crests be at an end. This writing I have committed to chance, neither showing it nor hiding it, and leaving it to chance if any man shall read it. Underneath there was a line written in darker ink, and in quite different handwriting. It was dated fifteen years later, and the initials R.D. were appended to it. It is not dead. I do not think that it will ever die. When Andrew Guerdon had finished reading this document, he looked slowly round the room. The subject got on his nerves and he was almost expecting to see something. Then he did his best to pull himself together. The first question he put to himself was this. Has Ted ever seen this? Obviously he had not. If he had, he could not have taken the tradition of Hal's planting so lightly, nor have spoken of it so freely. Besides, he would either have mentioned the document to Guerdon, or he would have kept it carefully concealed. He would not have allowed him to come across it casually in that way. Ted must never see it, thought Guerdon to himself. He then remembered the pile of weeds he had seen burning in the garden. He put the parchment in his pocket and hurried out. There was no one about. He spread the parchment on top of the pile and waited until it was entirely consumed. Then he went back to the smoking room. He felt easier now. Yes, thought Guerdon, if Ted first of all heard of the finding of that body, and then had read that document, I believe he would have gone mad. Things that come near us affect us deeply. Guerdon himself was much moved. He clung steadily to reason. He felt himself able to give a natural explanation, although yet he was nervous. The net of coincidence had closed in around him. 
the mention of Sir Edric's confession of the prophecy, which had subsequently become traditional in the village, alarmed him. And what did that last line mean? He supposed that R.D. must be the initials of Dr. Dennison. What did he mean by saying that the thing was not dead? Did he mean that it had not really been killed? That it had been gifted with some preternatural strength and vitality and had survived? Though Sir Edric did not know it? He recalled what he had said about the prolongation of the lives of such things. If it still survived, why had it never been seen? Had it joined to the wild hardiness of the beast a cunning that was human, or more than human? How could it have lived? There was water in the caves, he reflected, and food could have been secured, a wild beast's food. Or did Dr. Dennison mean that, though the thing itself was dead, its wraiths survived and haunted the place? He wondered how the doctor had found Sir Edric's confession, and why he had written that hue at the end of it. As he sat thinking, a low rumble of thunder in the distance startled him. He felt a touch of panic, a sudden impulse to leave Manstead at once, and, if possible, to take Ted with him. Ray could never live there. He went over the whole thing in his mind, again and again. At one time, calm and argumentative about it, and at another, shaken by blind horror. Sir Edric, on his return from Challency a few minutes afterwards, came straight to the smoking-room where Gordon was. He looked tired and depressed. He began to speak at once. "'You needn't tell me about it, about John Marsh. I heard about it in the village.' "'Did you? It's a painful occurrence, although, of course—' "'Stop. Don't go into it. Anything can be explained. I know that.' "'I went through those papers and account books while you were away. Most of them may just as well be destroyed.' But there are a few, I put them aside there, which might be kept. There was nothing of any interest. Thanks. I'm much obliged to you. Oh, and look here. I've got an idea. I've been examining the plans of the house, and I'm coming round to your opinion. There are some alterations which should be made, and yet I'm afraid that they'd make the place look patched and renovated. It wouldn't be a bad thing to know what Ray thought about it. That's impossible. The workmen come on Monday, and we can't consult her before then. Besides, I have a general notion what she would like. We could catch the night express to town at Challency, and Sir Edric rose from his seat angrily and hit the table. Good God, I don't sit there hunting up excuses to cover my cowardice and making it easy for me to bolt. What do you suppose the villagers would say? And what would my own servants say if I ran away tonight? I am a coward, I know it. I'm horribly afraid. But I'm not going to act like a coward if I can help it. Now, my dear chap, don't excite yourself. If you are going to care at all, to care as much as the conventional dam for what people say, you'll have no peace in life. And I don't believe you're afraid. What are you afraid of? Sir Edric paced once or twice up and down the room, and then sat down again before replying. Look here, Andrew. I'll make a clean breast of it. I've always laughed at the tradition. I forced myself, as it seemed at least, to disprove it by spending a night in Hell's planting. I took the pains even to make a theory which would account for its origin. All the time I had a sneaking, stifled belief in it. With the help of my reason, I crushed that. But now my reason has thrown up the job, and I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the undying thing that is in Hal's planting. I heard it that night. John Marsh saw it last night. They took me to see the body, and the face was awful. And I believe that one day it will come from Hal's planting. Yes, interrupted Gordon, I know, and at present I believe as much. Last night we laughed at the whole thing, and we shall live to laugh at it again and be ashamed of ourselves for a couple of superstitious old women. I fancy that beliefs are affected by weather. There's thunder in the air. No, said Sir Edric, my belief has come to stay. 
And what are you going to do? I'm going to test it on Monday. I can begin to get to work, and then I'll blow up Hell's planting with dynamite. After that, we shan't need to believe. We shall know. And now let's dismiss the subject. Come down into the billiard room and have a game. Until Monday, I won't think of the thing again. Long before dinner, Sir Edric's depression seemed to have completely vanished. At dinner, he was boisterous and amused. Afterwards, he told stories and was interesting. It was late at night. The terrific storm that was raging outside had awoke Werden from sleep. Hopeless of getting to sleep again, he had arisen and dressed, and now sat at the window seat, watching the storm. He had never seen anything like it before, and every now and then the sky seemed to be torn across, as if by hands of white fire. Suddenly he heard a tap at his door and looked around. Sir Edric had already entered. He also had dressed. He spoke in a curious, subdued voice. I thought you wouldn't be able to sleep through this. Do you remember that I shut and fastened the dining room window? Yes, I remember it. Well, come in here. Sir Edric led the way to his room, which was immediately over the dining room. By leaning out of window, they could see that the dining room window was open wide. Burglar, said Guerdon meditatively. No, Sir Edric answered, still speaking in a hushed voice. It is the undying thing. It has come for me. He snatched up the candle and made toward the staircase. Guerdon cut up the loaded revolver, which always lay on the table beside Sir Edric's bed, and followed him. Both men ran down the staircase as though there were not another moment to lose. Sir Edric rushed at the dining room door, opened it a little, and looked in. Then he turned to Guerdon, who was just behind him. "'Go back to your room,' he said authoritatively. "'I won't,' said Guerdon. "'Why?' What is it? Suddenly, the corners of Sir Edric's mouth shot outwards into the hideous grin of terror. It's there! It's there! he gasped. Then I come in with you. Go back! With a sudden movement, Sir Edric thrust Guerdon away from the door, and then, quick as light, darted in and locked the door behind him. Guerdon bent down and listened. He heard Sir Edric say in a firm voice, "'Who are you? What are you?' Then followed a heavy, snorting breathing, a low, vibrating growl, an awful cry, a scuffle. Then Gordon flung himself at the door. He kicked at the lock, but it would not give way. At last he fired his revolver at it. Then he managed to force his way into the room. It was perfectly empty. Overhead, he could hear footsteps. The noise had awakened the servants. They were standing, tremulous, on the upper landing. Through the open window, access to the garden was easy. Guerdon did not wait to get help, and in all probability none of the servants could have been persuaded to come with him. He climbed out alone and as if by some blind impulse, started to run as hard as he could in the direction of Hal's planting. He knew that Sir Edric would be found there. But when he got within a hundred yards of the plantation, he stopped. There had been a great flash of lightning, and he saw that it had struck one of the trees. Flames darted about the plantation as the dry bracken caught. Suddenly, in the light of another flash, he saw the whole of the trees fling their heads upwards. Then came a deafening crash, and the ground slipped under him, and he was flung forward on his face. The plantation had collapsed, fallen through into the caves beneath it. Guerdon slowly regained his feet. He was surprised to find that he was unhurt. He walked on a few steps, and then fell again. This time he had fainted away. End of section 10. Section 11 of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Nosetti, davidnosetti.com Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne The Grey Cat I heard this story from Archdeacon M. I should imagine that it would not be very difficult, by trimming it a little and altering the facts here and there, to make it capable of some simple explanation, but I have preferred to tell it as it was told to me. After all, there is some explanation possible, even if there is not one definite and simple explanation clearly indicated. It must rest with the reader, whether he will prefer to believe that some of the so-called uncivilized races may possess occult powers transcending anything of which the so-called civilized are capable, or whether he will consider that a series of coincidences is sufficient to account for the extraordinary incidents which, in a plain, brief way, I am about to relate. It does not seem to me essential to state which view I hold myself, or if I hold neither, and I have reason for not stating a third possible explanation. I must add a word or two with regard to Archdeacon M. At the time of this story he was in his fiftieth year. He was a fine scholar, a man of considerable learning. His religious views were remarkably broad, his enemies said remarkably thin. In his younger days he had been something of an athlete, but owing to age, sedentary habits, and some amount of self-indulgence, he had grown stout and no longer took exercise in any form. He had no nervous trouble of any kind. His death, from heart disease, took place about three years ago. He told me the story twice at my request. There was an interval of about six weeks between the two narrations. Some of the details were elicited by questions of my own. With this preliminary note, we may proceed to the story. In January 1881, Archdeacon M., who was a great admirer of Tennyson's poetry, came up to London for a few days, chiefly in order to witness the performance of The Cup at the Lyceum. He was not present on the first night, Monday, January 3rd, but on a later night in the same week. At that time, of course, the poet had not received his peerage, nor the actor his knighthood. On leaving the theatre, less satisfied with the play than with the magnificence of the setting, the archdeacon found some slight difficulty in getting a cab. He walked a little way down the Strand to find one when he encountered unexpectedly his old friend Guy Breddon. Breddon, that was not his real name, was a man of considerable fortune, a man of the learned societies, and devoted to Central African exploration. He was two or three years younger than the archdeacon, and a man of tremendous physique. Breddon was surprised to find the archdeacon in London, and the archdeacon was equally surprised to find Breddon in England at all. Breddon carried off the archdeacon with him to his rooms and sent a servant in a cab to the Langham to pay the archdeacon's bill and fetch his luggage. The archdeacon protested, but faintly, and Breddon would not hear of his hospitality being refused. Breddon's rooms were an expensive suite immediately over a ruinous upholsterer's in a street off Berkeley Square. There was a private street door, and from it a private staircase to the first and second floors. The first suite of rooms on the first floor occupied by Breddon was entirely shut off from the staircase by a door. The second floor suite, tenanted by an Irish MP, was similarly shut off, and at that time was unoccupied. Breddon and the archdeacon passed through the street door and up the stairs to the first landing, from whence, by the staircase door, they entered the flat. Breddon had only recently taken the flat, and the archdeacon had never been there before. It consisted of a broad L-shaped passage with rooms opening into it. There were many trophies on the walls. Horned heads glared at them, 
stealthy but stuffed beasts watched them furtively from under tables. There was a perfect arsenal of murderous weapons gleaming brightly under the shaded gaslights. Breton's servant prepared supper for them before leaving for the Langham, and soon the two men were discussing Mr. Tennyson, Mr. Irving, and a parody of The Queen of the May, which had recently appeared in Punch, and doing justice to some oysters, a cold pheasant with an excellent salad, and a bottle of seventy-four pommery. It was characteristic of the archdeacon that he remembered exactly the items of the supper, and that Breton rather neglected the wine. After supper they passed into the library, where a bright fire was burning. The archdeacon walked towards the fire, rubbing his plump hands together. As he did so, a portion of the great rug of grey fur on which he was standing seemed to rise up. It was a grey cat of enormous size, larger than any that the archdeacon had ever seen before, and of the same colour as the rug on which it had been sleeping. It rubbed itself affectionately against the archdeacon's leg, and purred as he bent down to stroke it. "'What an extraordinary animal!' said the archdeacon. "'I had no idea cats could grow to this size. Its head's queer, too, so much too small for the body.' "'Yes,' said Breton, "'and his feet are just as much too big.' The grey cat stretched himself voluptuously under the archdeacon's caressing hand, and the feet could be seen plainly. They were very broad, and the claws which shot out seemed unusually powerful and well-developed. The beast's coat was short, thick, and wiry. "'Most extraordinary!' the archdeacon repeated. He lowered himself into a comfortable chair by the fire. He was still bending over the cat and playing with it when a slight chink made him look up. Breddon was putting something down on the table behind the liquor decanters. "'Not that I know of. Freakish, I should say. We found him on board the boat when I left for home. May have come there for mice. He'd have been thrown overboard, but for me, I got rather interested in him. Smoke?' "'Oh, thank you.' Outside a cold north wind screamed in quick gusts. Within came the sharp scratch of the match on the ribbed glass as the archdeacon lit his cigar, the bubble of the rose-water in Breddon's hookah, the soft step of Breddon's man carrying the archdeacon's luggage into the bedroom at the end of the L-shaped passage, and the constant purring of the big grey cat. "'And what's the cat's name?' the archdeacon asked. Breton laughed. "'Well, if you must have the plain truth, he's called Grey Devil, or, more frequently, Devil Tout Court.' "'Really, now, really, you can't expect an archdeacon to use such abominable language. I shall call him Grey. Or perhaps Mr. Grey would be more respectful, seeing the shortness of our acquaintance.' "'Do you object to the smell of smoke, Mr. Gray? "'The intelligent beast does not object. "'Probably you've accustomed him to it.' "'Well, seeing what his name is, "'he could hardly object to smoke, could he?' "'Breddon's servant entered. "'As the door opened and shut, "'one heard for a moment the crackle "'of the newly lit fire in the room "'that awaited the archdeacon.' The servant swept up the hearth and, under archidiaconal direction, mixed a lengthy brandy and soda. He retired with the information that he would not be wanted again that night. "'Did you notice,' asked the archdeacon, "'the way Mr. Gray followed your man about? I never saw a more affectionate cat.' "'Think so,' said Breddon. "'Watch this time.' For the first time he approached the grey cat and stretched out his hand as if to pet him. In an instant the cat seemed to have gone mad. Its claws shot out, its back hooped, its coat bristled, its tail stood erect. It cursed and spat, 
and its small green eyes glared. But a close observer would have noticed that all the time it watched not only Breddon, but also the object which had chinked as Breddon had put it down behind the decanters. The archdeacon lay back in his chair and laughed heartily. Ho, ho, ho! What funny creatures they are, and never so funny as when they lose their tempers. Really, Mr. Gray, out of respect to my cloth, you might have refrained from swearing like that. Poor Mr. Gray, poor puss. Breddon resumed his seat with a grim smile. The grey cat slowly subsided and then thrust its head, as though demanding sympathy, into the fat palm of the archdeacon's dependent hand. Suddenly the archdeacon's eye lighted on the object which the cat had been watching, visible now that the servant had displaced the decanters. "'Goodness me!' he exclaimed. "'You've got a revolver there!' "'That is so,' said Breddon. "'Not loaded, I trust.' "'Oh, yes, fully loaded.' "'But isn't that very dangerous?' "'Well, no. I'm used to these things, and I'm not careless with them. I should have thought it more dangerous to have introduced Grey Devil to you without it. He's much more powerful than an ordinary cat.' and I fancy there's something beside Cat in his pedigree. When I bring a stranger to see him, I keep the cat covered with the revolver until I see how the land lies. To do the brute justice, he has always been most friendly with everybody except myself. I'm his only antipathy. He'd have gone for me just now, but that he's smart enough to be afraid of this. He tapped the revolver. "'I see,' said the archdeacon seriously. "'And can guess how it happened. "'You scared him one day by firing the revolver for joke. "'The report frightened him, "'and he's never forgiven you or forgotten the revolver. "'Wonderful memory some of these animals have.' "'Yes,' said Breddon. "'But that guess won't do.' I've never intentionally or by chance given the devil any reason for his enmity. So far as I know, he has never heard a firearm, and certainly he has never heard one since I made his acquaintance. Somebody may have scared him before, and I'm inclined to think that somebody did, for there can be no doubt that the brute knows all that a cat need know about a revolver, and that he's scared of it. The first time we met was almost in darkness. I'd got some cases that I was particular about, and the captain had said I could go down to look after them. Well, this beast suddenly came out of a lump of black and flew at me. I didn't even recognize that it was a cat, because he's so mighty big. I fetched him a clip on the side of the head that knocked him off and whipped out my iron. He was away in a streak. He knew, and I've had plenty of proof since that he knows. He'd bite me now if he had the chance, but he understands that he hasn't got the chance. I'm often half inclined to take him on plane, shooting barred, and to feel my own hands breaking his damned neck. Really, old man, really, said the archdeacon in perfunctory protest, as he rose and mixed himself another drink. Sorry to use strong language, but I don't love that cat, you know. The archdeacon expressed his surprise that in that case Breddon did not get rid of the brute. You come across him on board ship and he flies at you. You save his life, give him board and lodging, and he still hates you so much that he won't let you touch him. "'And you are no fonder of him than he is of you. "'Why don't you part company?' "'As for his board, I've rarely known him to eat anything except his own kill. "'He goes out hunting every night. "'I keep him simply and solely because I'm afraid of him. "'As long as I can keep him, I know my nerves are all right. 
if i let my funk of him make any difference well i shouldn't be much good in a central african forest at first i had some idea of taming him and besides there was a queer coincidence he rose and opened the window and grey devil slowly slunk up to it he paused a few moments on the window sill and then suddenly sprang and vanished what was the coincidence what do you think of that redden handed the archdeacon a figure of a cat which he had taken from the mantelpiece it was a little thing about three inches high in colour in the small head enormous feet and curiously human eyes it seemed an exact reproduction of grey devil a perfect likeness how did you get it made i got the likeness before i got the original a little jew dealer sold it to me the night before i left for england he thought it was egyptian and described it as an idol anyhow it was a niceish piece of jade i always thought jade was bright green it may be or white or brown it varies i don't think there can be any doubt that this little figure is old though i doubt if it's egyptian Breddon put it back in its place by the way that same night the little jew came to try and buy it back again he offered me twice what i'd given for it i said he must have found somebody who was pretty keen on it i asked if it was a collector the jew thought not said it was a coloured gentleman well that finished it i wasn't going to do anything to oblige a nigger the jew pleaded that it was a particularly fine buck nigger with mountains of money who'd been tracking the thing for years and hinted at all manner of mumbo-jumbo business to scare me i suppose however i wouldn't listen and kicked him out then came the coincidence having bought the likeness next day i found the living original rum wasn't it at this moment the clock struck and the archdeacon recognized with horror that it was very very much past the time when respectable archdeacons should be in bed and asleep he rose and said good night observing that he'd like to hear more about it on the morrow this was extremely unfortunate for it will be seen it is just at this part of the story that one wants full details and on the morrow it became impossible to elicit them before leaving the library Breddon closed the window and the archdeacon asked how mr grey as he called him would get back very likely he is back already he's got a special window in the kitchen made on purpose just big enough to let him get in and out as he likes but don't other cats get in too no said Breddon. other cats avoid grey devil the archdeacon found himself unaccountably nervous when he got to his room he owned to me that he had to satisfy himself that there was no one concealed under the bed or in the wardrobe however he got into bed and after a little while fell into a deep sleep his fire was burning brightly and the room was quite light shortly after four he was awakened by a loud scream still sleepy he did not for the moment locate the sound thinking that it must have come from the street outside but almost immediately afterwards he heard the report of a revolver fired twice in quick succession and then after a short pause a third time the archdeacon was terribly frightened he did not know what had happened and thought of armed burglars for a time he did not think it could have been more than a minute fear held him motionless then with an effort he rose lit the gas and hurried on his clothes as he was dressing he heard a step down the passage and a knock at his door he opened it and found Breddon's servant the man had put on a blue overcoat over his night things and wore slippers he was shivering with cold and terror 
"'Oh, my God, sir!' he exclaimed. "'Mr. Breddon shot himself. Would you come, sir?' The archdeacon followed the man to Breddon's bedroom. The smoke still hung thickly in the room. A mirror had been smashed and lay in fragments on the floor. On the bed, with his back to the archdeacon, lay Breddon, dead. His right hand still grasped the revolver, and there was a blackened wound behind the right ear. When the archdeacon came round to look at the face, he turned faint, and the servant took him out into the library and gave him brandy, the glasses and decanters still standing there. Breddon's face certainly had looked very ghastly. It had been scratched, torn and bitten. One eye was gone, and the whole face was covered with blood. "'Do you think it was that brute did it?' "'Sure of it, sir, spraying on his face while he was asleep. I knew it would happen one of these nights. He knew it, too. Always slept with the revolver by his side. He fired twice at the brute, but couldn't see for the blood. Then he killed himself.' It seemed likely enough, with his eyesight gone horribly mauled in an agony of pain, possibly believing that he was saving himself from a death still more horrible, Breddon might very well have turned the weapon on himself. "'What do we do now?' the man asked. "'We must get a doctor and fetch the police at once. Come!' As they turned the corner of the passage, they saw the door communicating with the staircase was open. "'Did you open that door?' asked the archdeacon. "'No,' said the man, aghast. "'Then who did?' "'Don't know, sir. Looks as if we weren't at the end of this yet.' They passed down the stairs together and found the street door also ajar. On the pavement outside lay a policeman slowly recovering consciousness. Breddon's man took the policeman's whistle and blew it. A passing hansom, going back to the mews, slowed up. The cab was sent to fetch a doctor, and communication with the police station rapidly followed. The injured policeman told a curious story. He was passing the house when he heard shots fired. Almost immediately afterwards, he heard the bolts of the front door being drawn and stepped back into the neighboring doorway. The front door opened, and a negro emerged clad in a gray tweed suit with a gray overcoat. The policeman jumped out, and without a second's hesitation, the black man felled him. It was all done before you could think, was the policeman's phrase. What kind of negro? asked the archdeacon. A big man, stood over six foot, and black as coal. He never waited to be challenged. The moment he knew that he was seen, he hid out. The policeman was not a very intelligent fellow, and there was little more to be got out of him. He had heard the shots, seen the street door open, and the man in grey appear, and had been felled by a lightning blow before he had time to do anything. The doctor, a plain, matter-of-fact little man, had no hesitation in saying that Breddon was dead, and must have died almost immediately. After the injuries received, respiration and heart action must have ceased at once. He was explaining something which oozed from the dead man's ear, when the archdeacon could stand it no longer, and staggered out into the library. There he found Breddon's servant, still in the blue overcoat, explaining to a policeman with a notebook that, as far as he knew, nothing was missing except a jade image or idol of a cat, which formerly stood on the mantelpiece. The cat, known as Grey Devil, was also missing, and, although a description of it was circulated in the public press, nothing was ever heard of it again but grey fur was found in the clenched left hand of the dead man. The inquest resulted in the customary verdict, and brought to light no new facts. But it may be as well to give what the police theory of the case was. According to the police, the suicide took place much as Breddon's servant had supposed. Mad with pain, and unable to bear the thought of his awful mutilation, Breddon had shot himself. 
the story of the jade image as far as it was known was told at the inquest the police held that this image was an idol that some uncivilized tribe was much perturbed by the theft of it and was ready to pay an enormously high price for its recovery the negro was assumed to be aware of this and to have determined to obtain possession of the idol by fair means or foul fair means failing it was suggested that the negro followed Breddon to england tracked him out and on the night in question found some means to conceal himself in Breddon's flat there it was assumed that he fell asleep was awakened by the screams and the sound of the firing and being scared caught up the jade image and made off realizing that the shots would have been heard outside and that his departure at that moment would be considered extremely suspicious he was ready as he opened the street door to fell the first man that he saw the temporary unconsciousness of the policeman gave him time to get away the theory sounds at first sight like the only possible theory when the archdeacon first told me the story i tried to find out indirectly whether he accepted it finding him rather disposed to fence with my hints and suggestions i put the question to him plainly and bluntly do you believe in the police theory he hesitated and then answered with complete frankness no most emphatically not why i asked and he went over the evidence with me in the first place i do not believe that breton in the ordinary sense committed suicide no amount of physical pain would have made him even think of it he had unending pluck he would have taken the facial disfigurement and loss of sight as the chances of war and would have done the best that could be done by a man with such awful disabilities one must admit that he fired the fatal shot the medical evidence on that point is too strong to be gainsaid but he fired it under circumstances of supernatural horror of which we thank god know nothing i'm naturally slow to admit supernatural explanation well let's go on what's this mysterious tribe the police talk about i want to know where it lives and what its name is it's wealthy enough to offer a huge reward it must be of some importance the negro managed to get in and secrete himself how where i know the flat and that theory won't do we don't even know that it was the negro who took the little image though i believe it was anyhow how did the negro get away at that hour of the morning absolutely unobserved negroes are not as so common in london that they can walk about without being noticed yet not one trace of him was ever found and equally mysterious is the disappearance of the grey cat it was such an extraordinary brute and the description of it was so widely circulated that it would have seemed almost certain we should hear of it again well we've not heard we discussed the police theory for some time and something which he happened to say led me to exclaim really do you mean to say that the grey cat actually was the negro no he replied N not exactly that something near it cats are strange animals anyhow needn't remind you of their connection with certain old religions or with that witchcraft in which even england to-day some still believe and not so long ago almost all believed i have never by the way seen a good explanation of the fact that there are people who cannot bear to be in a room with a cat and are aware of its presence as if by some mysterious extra sense 
Let me remind you of the belief which undoubtedly exists both in China and Japan, that evil spirits may enter into certain of the lower animals, the fox and badger especially. Every student of demonology knows about these things, but that idea of evil spirits taking possession of cats or foxes is surely a heathen superstition which you cannot hold. Well, I have read of the evil spirits that entered into the swine. Think it over, and keep an open mind. End of section 11. Recording by David Nosetti. DavidNosetti.com End of Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne